Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vax Talk. Tonight, we have put together an informational session on the COVID-19 vaccine, and we hope to address some of your questions and concerns. This event is brought to you by the 100 Black Men of South Metro Atlanta and Viral Solutions. We would like to thank everyone who came together to make this event possible. Next slide. This evening, we'll address several topics. The current status of COVID-19, the vaccines, who should get the vaccines, the distribution process for the vaccine, and can we trust the vaccines? Next slide. I would like to begin by introducing our panel as well as our clinical trial participants. I'm Michelle Wan, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Viral Solutions. I'm also an ER doc and an emergency physician at Emory Decatur and Emory Hillendale, where I practice full time. We have PA Ron Sanders, who is the president and co-founder of Viral Solutions. He also comes to the table with over 10 years of clinical experience as former Emory ER lead PA. We have Dr. Lamar Cochran, who is the vice president of medical affairs and vice chief of emergency medicine at Emory Hillendale. And the real heroes of tonight are Ms. Ashley Neal, who is our Pfizer clinical trial participant, and Mr. Clifton Crawley, our Moderna clinical trial participant. Next slide. I'd like to begin by just giving the audience some instructions for a question and answer session. Um, we uh, will be doing a Q&A session after the panel, so please add your questions in the comments and we will address them after. I also want to remind everyone to please complete the seven question survey that will be sent to you. It should take you no longer than two minutes to complete. Even if you have to leave the session early for any reason, please do uh, take a moment to complete the survey. Thank you. Next slide. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the decision to get the vaccine is a very deeply personal one. Um, we want to share with you some information to help you uh, and guide you with some uh, data and information if you are still in the process of making that decision. If you're tuning in tonight and you have questions or are just seeking some guidance as you make your decision, that's precisely what we'd like to do. As far as me, I, you know, I can share with you why I made my decision. I did a personal risk benefit analysis and I decided that I would rather risk the mild side effects of getting the vaccine versus getting the COVID infection. Um, I made that decision, you know, seeing the uh, death and suffering uh, that I witnessed in my patients uh, and their families every day in the ER, as well as the grim statistics that you can see outlined on this slide. Um, you know, we're surrounded by the, those facts every day in the media, so I don't need to belabor that point. Um, I think you know, a couple other things came into that uh, decision that I made. Um, my status as a healthcare worker, um, knowing that healthcare workers as well as communities of color are all um, falling victim to this virus disproportionately uh, uh, from others, as well as the fact that, you know, I made the decision for myself, um, my beautiful daughter who's pictured here. I wanna make sure that I'm here to take care of her and watch her grow up. Uh, the elders in my family who I definitely wanna protect, and bringing it back to my patients and the community uh, that I live in. I saw getting the vaccine as me doing my part, a small step uh, to getting us closer to normalcy. Next slide. So first I'd like to begin by uh, talking about the current status of COVID-19. Next slide. Nationwide, we have seen 26 million cases and 440 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, last month, January, has been the deadliest month thus far with over 95,000 deaths. Here in Georgia, we have seen over 900,000 cases overall. And in the last 24 hours, uh, if you were to do a snapshot of what we've seen, we've seen 3,000 newly confirmed cases. This does uh, mark an overall downtrend in the rate of new cases. 44 confirmed deaths, 86 new hospitalizations. Georgia currently ranks 23rd in the number of COVID cases and 43rd in the nation for testing. The top five counties are Hall, DeKalb, Cobb, Fulton, and Gwinnett. Right now, there is an unknown. We don't know yet how the impact of the variants or the uh, mutations in the virus are gonna impact these numbers as it pertains to transmissibility, which is the ability to pass the virus from one person to another or the risk of reinfection. 
So I'm going to transition to talking about our next topic, which is the vaccines. There are two currently available vaccines, and both of these happen to be mRNA vaccines. So I've had a lot of people uh, ask me what that means. And I think the take home message is that how the mRNA vaccine works is it sends a message to your immune system to create the spike protein of uh, the coronavirus. And this is not actually creating the coronavirus. It's the spike protein that's on the outside of the coronavirus. And so your body um, takes this message and it creates that spike protein. And it also produces antibodies that seek to destroy that spike protein because they've recognized it as a foreign substance and uh, that it doesn't belong there. It sees it as an invader and it seeks to destroy that. So how it works to protect you is that if your body should now, your immune system should now see the spike protein of the actual coronavirus in the future, it's prepared and it's ready uh, to seek and destroy and kill the coronavirus before you should become sick or have symptoms from COVID. Next slide. So the first of the two mRNA vaccines available I'm gonna discuss is the Pfizer vaccine, and that's actually the one that I happen to get. And it's two doses uh, to complete the series, and it's separated by three weeks. You do have 95% uh, effective immunity against COVID, and you, you have about half of that after day 10 from the first shot. And uh, to achieve the full 95%, you do have to wait uh, seven days after the booster shot. There are some challenges that uh, Mr. Sanders is going to cover when he discusses um, the distribution process for the vaccine. It does require extreme cold temperature storage. The Moderna vaccine is also two doses to complete the series. Uh, it's separated by four weeks in comparison to the three uh, with the Pfizer. It is 94% effective, so similar efficacy. And it does require uh, freezers, but not uh, the extreme cold as with uh, the Pfizer. Next slide. Both of these mRNA virus um, or mRNA uh, vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, uh, the data that has been published on the efficacy is based on the first and the second dose being the same. So what that means is that we really want to try to make sure that if you are, if you decide to get the vaccine, that you get the same product for the second dose that you received for the first. Um, you can do that by making sure that you keep your vaccination card with the sticker that has the product name on it, but. The CDC also has recognized that there are shortages and um, other obstacles that have prevented people from getting the vaccine. So um, they also have recent, recently released guidelines that in exceptional situations, you can actually get a different um, mRNA vaccine product, which in this case, the only two products available are the Pfizer or the Moderna. Um, you can get the, a second dose that's different from the first one, as long as you've waited 28 days between the two doses. Next slide. Um, another product that's not yet available, but potentially could be ready to be in arms uh, late February or early March is a Johnson & Johnson. So this is a little different than the mRNA product. This actually uses a weakened common cold virus called an adenovirus, and that carries those same instructions to make the spike protein. This is one shot versus two, and it does have much easier storage potential. I'm sure you've seen a lot of that in the media as well. Next slide. The efficacy, um, uh, that's reported for the uh, Johnson & Johnson is 66% uh, for symptomatic and severe COVID at 28 days. We think that this is largely in part because um, it did perform more poorly in South Africa where the majority of the people infected were infected with this new variant. But interestingly, even taking all of that into consideration, we see that there's 85% effectiveness against severe COVID at 28 days. Um, and at 49 days, that increases to 100%. So that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next slide. There are many others. Um, there's an uh, Oxford AstraZeneca product that's been approved for uh, use in the UK. Uh, the Novavax and Janssen products are pending. The Merck uh, vaccine has recently been discontinued. Their trial stopped because of poor performance in comparison to placebo. The Chinese vaccines uh, that are currently uh, being looked at are the Sinovax, the CanSino, and Sinopharm, and hundreds of others in clinical trials. I won't, um, in the interest of time, I won't delve too deeply into this because uh, we want to make sure we leave ample time for the question and answer session. But perhaps when we do our follow-up session next week, there will be more data um, and updates on that. Next slide. So the unknowns, um, obviously there's you know, many unknowns still. Um, the one unknown with the vaccine is uh, you know, how effective it is against asymptomatic spread. So what that means is even though when you're vaccinated, you're protected from becoming sick yourself, 
does this prevent you from spreading it and becoming an asymptomatic carrier and spreading it to others who can then become infected and sick with COVID? Um, it's also unclear how the vaccines will play out as far as effectiveness against future variants. Um, this all drives home the importance of continuing to wear your mask and socially distance post-vaccination. Next slide. So next up, we have PA Ron Sanders, president and co-founder of Viral Solutions, who will discuss who should get the vaccine. Hey, how's everybody? Nice to meet you. My name is Ron Sanders, uh, physician assistant, president and co-founder of Viral Solutions. I'm here to talk about who should get the vaccine. Okay, as you get the vaccine, right now there's different um, classes or phases in which uh, society uh, is able to uh, be able to be administered the vaccine. Uh, it's dependent on state. Um, however, in the state of Georgia, we're in phase 1A. Phase 1A includes all healthcare workers, long-term facility and staff residents, and people above the age of 65. These are our high-risk patient population who can have the worst uh, morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. The next phase, which we are not in yet, which will be phase 1B, is uh, designed for essential workers that are not healthcare. Um, that includes um, everybody from like your uh, frontline workers, like uh, working in um, the grocery stores, things of that nature, and people that are also around high risk patients. Uh, phase 1C would be the next phase after that. That's uh, ages 16 or 64. I want to point out that the um, Ages 16 through uh, 16 and above can only be administered by Pfizer, which has the approved indication for 16 and above. The Moderna, which the other vaccine is approved, is only indicated for people 18 and above. Um, this is for people with medical conditions that correlate with severe symptoms related to COVID-19. And then after that, eventually, everyone in the general public will be able to be administered the vaccine. Next slide. The distribution is a is a is a tricky one. We're experiencing this with viral solutions where we're trying to um, secure the supply chain and thus try to get it from the manufacturer into the patient's arms. And what makes it hard with the two vaccines now, with the soon to be third vaccine from J and J, which it will be easier, is um, the handling of those vaccines. Pfizer is probably the trickiest and hardest to handle. Uh, currently, you can store it in dry ice for thirty days, or you have to have it in negative eighty temperature. Um, which are specialized freezers that uh, are designed um, to keep a tight range in order to keep the vaccine um, viable. Once you refrigerate it, you only have five days to administer. And then once you mix it, you only have six hours. Uh, the other vaccine, which is Moderna, uh, is not quite as sensitive as Pfizer, but it still brings its own challenges. Um, the temperature is not as uh, severely low as the Pfizer vaccine. It could be store it at negative 20 and then refrigerate it for um, 30 days versus five days as the Pfizer before you have 12 hours to administer the vaccine once you've punctured it. Uh, the distribution, um, total distributed today, and this is as of, um, yes, these are yesterday's numbers. Uh, total distributed is 1.4 million. Pfizer shipped is uh, 585,000. Moderna shipped is 855,000. Uh, total administered is a little under a million for um, uh, the state of Georgia. Next slide. Uh, can we trust the vaccine? I'm going to send it back to Michelle Wan, our lovely host, um, to introduce the next position. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Cochran, who will cover a hot button topic. Can we trust the vaccine? Hello, everybody. Um, as Dr. Wan said, my name is uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Cochran. Um, and so I have the all important uh, question of, can we trust the vaccination? And that was one of the big questions I had myself. Uh, to be honest with you, I had, uh, I did hesitate about getting the vaccination because um, I had questions of how can this vaccination be safe and how we know it's safe 
especially since it seemed to have come out, come out to the market so quickly. Um, I had to reach out to different colleagues that were really uh, into research. I had to do my own research. And I came to the conclusion that the simple answer is yes, the vaccination is safe. Um, while the vaccination was developed quickly um, at a fast pace, um, that pace did not compromise the safety, nor did it compromise the scientific integrity. All vaccinations, all medications have to go through different governing bodies. The biggest one is that is going to be the FDA. Um, this and this vaccination was the same. It went through all the processes of going through that, going through uh, the proper clinical trials and getting approval through the FDA, making sure it was effective and making sure it was safe. Um, so how did we take this vaccination, get it to market so quickly and how, and how do we know it's safe? Um, a busy slide, but I kind of want to walk you through it. One of the big things is when a pharmaceutical company is going to develop a uh, drug or a vaccination, what they do is they do clinical trials of it. They get test subjects and they go through all that only after they've gone through the rigorous uh, studies, the rigorous clinical, clinical trials, and they prove that the drug or the vaccination is safe and effective. At that point, they will start production. What was different with the COVID vaccination um, was that they actually started production while they were going through the clinical trials. Um, so what this did was once, if, and when this vaccination was approved to be safe, it was already ready to go and hit the market. Typically, this would be a big risk for a pharmaceutical company. They would not start producing a medication or a vaccination before it was approved by the FDA, because if it did not get approved and it was denied, you have spent a lot of resources on development. So what the federal government did was they made um they gave the uh, large pharmaceutical companies um allocated dollars to start producing the vaccination so when it did come to so when it did come to um it was approved it we can start and giving out to the uh giving out to the public um so other questions are how do we know that it's safe for me um how did i know it's safe for me as a black male how do you know it's safe for you, whatever demographic you are? Um, the phase three clinical trial, which is uh, the stage that they get tens of thousands of individuals to enter into um, the trial and they receive the proper dose of the vaccination or medication and they uh, study the effects. And that same thing happened with um, the vaccinations. Um, that study group was diverse. Uh, most of it was out of the United States, but it also included Africa and it included uh, people from Europe. About 10% of the stage three uh, clinical trial participants were um, with African Americans. So that definitely made me feel more comfortable that um, it was tested on them and shown to be safe. Um, a lot, um, there's a lot of skepticism about research um, as well, uh, a lot of that comes back to the trial of the Tuskegee uh, penicillin uh, syphilis trial. Um, a lot of thing, a lot is different about that trial, how that was conducted, and how this was conducted. With the uh, Tuskegee syphilis trial, one it only consists of one demographic of black male, which does not give you any diversity. In this study, like I just mentioned, there was a diverse uh, background of those who were who were studied. And they studied that to completion and they realized that it was effective and safe. So definitely different than how that was done. Also, after that, after the Tuskegee syphilis trial, they put in governing bodies that are over the trial. They have nothing to do with the research to make sure unethical things don't happen like that again. Um, so I want to talk about a little about the side effects. So what are the side effects? That's the biggest thing we want to know. We want to know what the short-term side effects are. We want to know the long-term side effects. Well, they realize that most of these side effects are minor and they last for maybe one to two days. That's going to consist of pain in the arm that you get the injection, uh, headache, you might feel fatigue. Um, these are self-limiting, meaning that they typically go away on their own within one to two days. Um, so I had to ask myself the question, risk versus benefit that's what it comes down to is there more of a benefit from taking the vaccination or are there more of a risk being an emergency medicine physician i've seen the worst of COVID. 
face to face. Um, leads to significant morbidities, leads to significant mortality. Um, also, it's really changed our way of living. Wear a mask everywhere, social distancing. You just don't have that social connection with family and friends. And for me, when I look at the effects of the vaccination, which are safe, symptoms that last one to two days, they far outweigh the risk of getting COVID. And so for me, it was a no brainer after doing our research that getting the COVID vaccination um, was safe. And that's why I took the shot and I'm fully vaccinated with both my shots and I've been doing great ever since. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Next up, we have Ms. Ashley Neely, our Pfizer clinical trial participant, who will share her experience with us. Hi, so good evening. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ashley Neely, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my clinical trial experience. Um, so I decided back in August that I wanted to participate in a vaccine clinical trial because I was watching a congressional hearing that was featuring Dr. Fauci, and he mentioned that a vaccine could not be produced without African Americans participating. And I was well aware of the history that African Americans have faced with medical racism that we still experience today. So I knew that there was going to be a tough challenge to try to get African Americans to participate in a clinical trial, especially for a new vaccine with COVID. So I took that as a call to action, so it's something I could do to help my community. So I immediately went to the website that Dr. Fauci um, mentioned and signed up for a clinical trial. Um, I had never heard anything back. So a few days later, I actually saw an ad on Facebook, which I clicked on, which said that they were now enrolling volunteers for a clinical trial. So I filled out that form and then less than two hours later, I actually got a um, call from the clinical trial site um, screening me, asking me just a few basic questions about my health and making sure that I was a healthy volunteer. And they told me that I was eligible to participate in the trial. They said I could come as early as the next day, but I was not that convinced just yet. So I um, told them I would come next week um, and went over it with my friends and family who had a lot of mixed reactions. So some of my friends were really excited, telling me I should definitely go do it. I might get the vaccine. Um, some were a little more skeptical, as I know many people are, asking why would you want to do something like that, especially with something that's brand new that's never been tested in humans, such as mRNA. Um, but after reading my informed consent document, which is what um, someone mentioned earlier, that they have to give out patents now to make sure that what you're participating isn't safe, um, the biggest side effect they mentioned I could experience were some flu-like symptoms, and I felt that was a really small price to pay to be able to make sure that we have a safe and effective vaccine. So a little bit about the process. Um, whenever I first arrived that day, of course, they did the standard vital signs. They take your height and weight, your temperature. They go over extensively over any medication that you're taking. So you have to bring all those in. Um, since I'm a woman in a, in a clinical trial, I had to do a pregnancy test because during the trial at that time, they were not a rolling pregnant woman. Um, so that test has to come back negative before they let you participate. And then the doctor just goes over your medical history. They check your lungs and then they just look at your tongue and make sure that everything's fine. Um, I tell people the worst part of clinical trial for me was actually getting the COVID test. So if you have not had one before that was administered by another person, that's the most painful part. I heard someone actually screaming in the background just from taking that COVID test. Um, they also draw your blood. So that's where they can get a baseline if you've had any previous exposure to COVID or if you had an infection of COVID before. So for Pfizer, um, they did test it on participants who um, both had COVID in the past and people that never had infections. And then finally, you go to your last room or second to last room, and that's where they have you download an app. So I know people are curious and how do they know that this product is effective? Well, they actually make you keep a diary within this app that asks you every week if you have any COVID-19 symptoms. And if you do, you have a take home test that you could um, swab yourself and then they would send that in for a sample. And then they ask you that every week for the duration of the trial. And then finally, you go to the last room and you get your shot. 
And for clinical trials, um, they have to have a control group. So that's how they determine the effectiveness. So half the people or about half the people will get the vaccine and half the people will get the placebo. So you don't know which one you're getting, um, but sometimes you're able to tell. And so I got my shot, um, had to stay for about 30 minutes after for observation to make sure that I did not have any type of side effects or allergic reaction to it immediately. And then I was cleared to go home. And I was perfectly fine the rest of the day. Um, but the next day when I was trying to get out of bed, I felt really fatigued, not something I haven't really felt before. And then for the rest of the day, I was kind of groggy. I had body aches, um, warm body. I had sweating and a loss of appetite, which is an indication that I got the vaccine, but I won't know, unfortunately, until next week to tell you all for sure. Um, but everything that I experienced was consistent with what they put on the informed consent document that was related to the vaccine and not having a saltwater placebo injection. And so then I went back three weeks later, um, repeated that same process, um, got my second shot and was fine. And the next day I didn't have those same side effects. Um, so as mentioned before, the clinical trial process has been really easy and really diverse. Um, we're actually in the clinical trial for a total of two years, and that may be extended, especially if they start offering booster shots to, to um, be in line with these different variants. So you can feel comfortable knowing that there's people that look like you that are participated in these trials that have all different ages. So especially for Pfizer, there is about 10% African Americans. And even within that group and with all the groups, they were also have people with a lot of pre-existing conditions. So they weren't just all healthy volunteers. They want to make sure it worked on people with hypertension or diabetes and anything else that might experience in the real world that are at high risk. So since then, I've just been trying to share my experience with others um, to make people feel more comfortable so they can make an informed decision if it's right for them. So I um, look forward to engaging you all later if you want to know more about my clinical trial experience. So thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for sharing your experience with us and for your bravery and being a part of the Pfizer clinical trial. Next up and closing out our session, we have Mr. Clifton Crawley, who is our Moderna vaccine clinical trial participant, who will also be sharing his experience with us. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Cliff Crawley. Um, I am a licensed master of social worker, or in some cases you could say medical social work because I work at two hospitals, both um, Grady Healthcare and um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Uh, the reason I participated in the trials was because, you know, like the doctors were saying, I saw a lot of COVID patients. We had there as a whole wing of COVID patients in Grady. And at this point, I think Grady is full when it concerns with COVID patients. And at the time it was a bursting out. They had even a station outside of Grady where they were doing testing and people were staying in the Georgia World Congress Center due to it. And most of those people um, look like us, look like me. Um, so, you know, the I kept hearing about, you know, they needed minority participation in some of the trials. But what really did it for me was when um, at CHOA in Eggleston, we had a patient who passed away. And what is funny, or not funny, but interesting is that a lot of the patients that I saw at CHOA were black. And the ones that were really seriously affected were black boys. Matter of fact, to this day, the only children that I've seen pass away from COVID have been black boys. So upon his death, um, that pretty much made me really want to get, you know, involved. Um, and the trial. So I did a little research. I, I learned that the Moderna trial, the vaccine was in cooperation with the NIH and the lead virologist. One of the lead virologists is Ms. Uh, Kim, Kimeka Corbett. I hope I'm saying her name right. And she's one of the lead virologists. She's a black woman. And um, there was a strong minority participation, around 30% minority participation in the trial. So um, where there, there was a target for around 30% minority participation for the trial. So I said, well, you know what, let's do it. And um, being at Eggleston is close to Emory. I did the Emory trial at the Emory Hope Clinic. Um, one day visit, um, they took my blood, did a swab test, and they gave me a long needle and put it in my shoulder. Um, it's probably longer than the needles that the current people are taking right now that are getting vaccinated because my needle was long and I, I think no one else has that kind of issue. Uh, so so um, 
afterwards, I had a so short the next day. But other than that, I have not had any symptoms. Um, I've been I've taken two shots in September, and uh, I learned two three weeks ago because I work in the medical field they unbind me, and that's when they take your information. They found out if you got the placebo, or if you actually got the vaccination. Turns out, I got the vaccination in September. So I've been vaccinated since the end of September of 2020. I have not had any complications. Um, if anyone has any questions or any other issues, you're welcome to hit me up. I'll stay on the line for the Q&A, but that's pretty much my experience in the trials. And that's all. All right. Thank you, Ashley and Clifton, for sharing your experience with us. And thank you for your courage in being part of the vaccine clinical trials. Your bravery has been a huge part of getting out of this pandemic. And thank you to Ron and Dr. Cochran for being on our panel. Um, next slide. We want to do our uh, take a moment to remind everyone to do uh, the survey and uh, we're gonna bring everyone back for the question and answer. Um, we also wanna make sure that we uh, thank uh, Viral Solutions and the Fulton and DeKalb Hospital Authority, as well as President Vaughn of the 100 Black Men of South Metro Atlanta. I think we're having some connection issues here. Okay, perfect. Um, so I am gonna start fielding some questions. Again, if you have questions that you would like for the panel to address, please do submit them in the comment section. Um, first up, I have a question. Uh, is the vaccine safe for people with allergies? Um, Dr. Co Cochran, you covered the uh, portion on can we trust the vaccines? Would you like to cover that question? Sure, I, I can take that one. Um, again, the answer is, is yes. Uh, what I would give a, a caveat to is um, I would go and check out the ingredients of the vaccination. You can find them online, um, particularly with allergies. Um, you want to make sure you're not allergic to any of the particular uh, ingredients in the vaccination. But Overall, just general allergies, seasonal allergies, um, it is safe for those individuals. Uh, if you do have an allergic reaction, um, it's going to, the treatment is going to be the same for anybody who's prone to have allergies or not, which is going to be antihistamines, uh, possibly steroids. So if you do have any reaction like that, um, one, that's why they keep you on site for at least 15 minutes to monitor you for that. And if you do have some late symptoms, I do recommend you follow your primary care physician. But in general, it is still safe to get the vaccination, even if you have allergies. Thanks, Dr. Cochran. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity, and what length of time do you think it will take to get there? Um, Ron, are you up for that one? Yes, I can take that one. Uh, so uh, experts uh, believe that anywhere from 75 to 85% of the population needs to uh, be infected and have antibodies in order to achieve herd immunity. There's two ways you can do this. Um, the not so pleasant way is that we just naturally get infected by COVID-19. We overrun the hospitals. We have a high death toll and, um, <clears throat> you know, death rates spiral out of control. The, the better way is through a vaccine, which is safer, um, 
the safe <laughs> world because you're not actually being infected with the virus. And with the most recent studies, you're able to mitigate uh, the worst case scenarios. How long would this take? Um, depends on the vaccine rollout. Of course, kids will probably be the last because all the studies to date have been done in adults with a few um, for 16 and above, so a few older teenagers. Uh, some experts believe that we can have herd immunity by next fall. Um, could be sooner, could be later um, to be determined. This is the first time we've been in a pandemic. We're in uncharted territory. So, so hopefully uh, sooner the better. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Next question. How long will it be before it's open to the general public? Ron, that's probably a great question for you also, since you talked about the, uh, who should be getting the vaccines. Say, say, repeat that again, Michelle. Sorry, had a little break up. I think we're having some connection issues. Um, questions, the clinical trial participants. Um, are you guys up for a question? All right, so whoever wants to take this one, I'll, I'll let you guys decide. Um, did either of the participants take the flu vaccine on a regular basis? And if so, did this influence your willingness to participate in the trials? Well, I work in hospitals, so I have to take it every year. Um, yeah, uh, it didn't. It didn't have any influence on me participating in the trial. The, I participated in the trials t was to serve and um, hopefully be somewhat of a, a part of the process and helping make sure Black people are safe. And I can answer that too. Um, prior to this year, I've never taken the flu vaccine. Knock on wood, I've never had the flu. I didn't realize it was such a big deal until learning about COVID. Um, so it didn't have any impact on me um, getting the COVID vaccine. But after participating in a trial, I did get the flu vaccine last year. Okay, let's see if I can get to another question here. All right, moderators, can I have a question submitted to me, please? Someone can send them over from Facebook. All right, which vaccine offers the longest immunity or protection? I can go Who wants to take that, that one? Um, really, right now, um, there's not any one vaccine that's gonna be better than the other as far as how long it's gonna last. And right now, the, the answer to truly how long it's gonna last is gonna be a year, uh, months, or longer than that, it's really unknown. Right now, the uh, we know it's effective up to four to five months, um, but as time goes on, we'll have a better answer of that. Uh, we can assume that this is likely going to be something like the flu that vaccine that you'll probably have to get it annually, um, but we'll have more data on that as more people get the vaccination and we study it as we uh, as time goes on. All right. Um, Go ahead. The, the Moderna trial supposedly lasts around a year. The okay. vaccine is supposed to be good for about a year as of right now, but you know, that's subject to change as, as the doctor was saying. I uh, also would like to add that um, most coronaviruses, the, the ones that we know of, have an average immunity of one to three years. Um, if you just had to take that uh, conventional knowledge we have just on the family itself, it would lead you to think that immunity will at least be one to three years with it more than likely starting to soften after about nine to 12 months. But COVID-19 is novel. It's a new virus. We're still learning about it. I remember when the outbreak first happened, um, we thought that it, you got it by droplets. You touched the surfaces and touched your face. Now we're learning it is more, you know, droplets through respiratory speaking and things of that nature. So um, as this unfolds, we're going to learn more and we're going to be able to, you know, educate people even better, but um, I can agree with Clifton, likely it would be at least a year, more than likely. All 
All right. Um, and let's see. I want to ask um, another question. How can we get the vaccines out to the community, churches, recreation centers, since it is so difficult for some people to get appointments and go to a facility? Can you hear where the current vaccines require Who'd a certain like to level? Take that question. I'll let the docs take it. Well, I know that the current vaccines require a certain level of temperature, so it'll be hard to get immobilized outside of facilities. Um, I don't know what the Johnson & Johnson vaccine might differ from them. All right, stand by for just one moment, please. Dr. Cochran or Ron, would you like to take a stab at answering that question? Uh, I, I kind of glitched out a little bit. If you could repeat the question, I could try to answer it. Okay, I think I had a request to repeat the question. How can we get the vaccines out to the community? For instance, churches, recreation centers, since it is so difficult for some people to get appointments and go to a facility. I would say right now, um, the first thing is, there's a lot of you know, private companies, including BioSolutions, that is, um, has applied to receive the vaccination um, so that we can um, go to communities disperse ourselves to different communities to make access easier um, by distance. Um, we, it, it is a big undertaking because it does require um, freezers, storage space, uh, but that's something the BioSolutions is trying to do to reach more people in the community uh, by setting up different locations. But um, the hardest part is getting the allocation of the vaccination. So once we get that, um, that's gonna be the way to get it out to more people. Okay, um, let's have another question. Let's see, do we know when the vaccination will be available for children? So currently there are studies going on for Moderna and Pfizer, and it appears that ages 12 to 15, because remember Pfizer is 16 and above, 12 to 15 should be really available by the beginning of this next school year, if everything goes like it should. And um, the rest of the childhood population should be um, geared and ready by early next spring, maybe um, February, but that's the current timeline that's been laid out for those two manufacturers at least. Remember Pfizer and Moderna were the first two to make it uh, to market. So they have a leg up on the phase three trials that are going on currently.
Hey, Lamar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I think we might have lost our moderator. Okay, I, I, um, Michelle's having some technical difficulties. I'll try to cover for her. Uh, Lamar, do you want to answer the question about um, when the general public may be able to get vaccinated? Um, as uh, Ron Sanders actually mentioned, mentioned in his talk, it has to go through the different phases, what is going to be your um, frontline workers, um, the elderly. Uh, we're presuming that by spring, hopefully, once the allocations come out, hopefully the rest of the population can start getting vaccinated. So um, we're assuming around, uh, around springtime going into summertime, that's when the general population uh, will start getting vaccinated. Um, there's actually not a timeline, um, actual, actual date, but it just depends on when they can get those first phases um, vaccinated. Uh, question for the trial participants. First, I want to thank you for uh, participating. Your courage is, I mean, it's much appreciated from here. We definitely need more African-American involvement so we know how safe and effective it is um, for our culture and our race. Um, what, um, is, and I know this may have been answered earlier, but what actually encouraged you to participate um, versus just standing on the sideline? What drove you to do that? Yeah, so I had um, two main reasons. One, um, as I mentioned, I know the history that we've had with medical racism and that it would be hard to get um, people to participate in the trial. And I was afraid that if we didn't have enough um, African-Americans participating in the trial, that when it came to market like it is now, we would find out the hard way if it wasn't as effective on us. And then the second reason was that I think a lot of people were trying to figure out what they can do to help get out of this pandemic. So part of me really want to get the vaccine, too. So since this was a way for me to do that. So I had two main reasons to make sure it worked. And then I wanted to get the vaccine. So hopefully I did. For me, I got tired of seeing black death. Um, a lot of black people were dying and uh, I got tired of seeing it. So, you know, I volunteered my body to, to hopefully help there and the future people, uh, populations. And Dr. Cochran, this is a, a question for you. Um, I know you spoke about safety. Um, I think a lot of people don't know how the vaccine even works. Uh, in great detail. If I got the vaccine myself, would I get infected with the actual COVID-19 virus and could I infect someone else? Like, what is the technology that makes you feel so um, secure that it's safe? So with pretty much all vaccinations, um, typically sometimes there is a um, inactive form of the virus or whatever that you're kind of be becoming immune to. And what your body is, it it actually creates a defense. It creates what we call antibodies. And once your body is exposed to a certain organism, you have what you call natural immunity, where your body makes those antibodies. So if someone has been exposed from COVID, they're going to make those antibodies, and they'll be protected for a certain amount of time, um, typically maybe about three months. Uh, but even if you've had the um, COVID virus and you have antibodies, they will not, they don't last as long as if you get the, as long as you get the, as long as it would when you get the vaccination. Those antibodies last a lot longer, up to at least a year or more, um, what they're uh, assuming, presuming. So um, typically you're not, you should not, you do not get the COVID vaccination. They're not giving you the live uh, COVID um, virus. So, you, so that's why you're not going to get, that's why it's safe because you're not actually getting the virus. When you get a vaccination, you're getting either a dead form of it or you're getting the antibodies for it. And antibodies are not what causes you to become sick from it. Um, they are the protection. Um, they, they give you protection from getting it again. Perfect. Uh, Clifton Ashley, uh, another question for you two. Uh, would you participate in another clinical trial and why? It all depends. Um, I could, I don't rule it out, but it just depends on what's going on and the need. Um, I thought there was a specific need as a black man. Um, black men have been affected higher rates than any other population, I believe. 
concerning COVID, we've had a lot of, um, so that was a driving factor for me. I don't know if there'll be another, you know, disease or hopefully there won't be another pandemic to where that will make me feel the need to participate. But if so, then it's, it's, still, it's up in the air. I, I don't have any thoughts on that right now. And for me, I actually would. Um, but through this process, I've learned more about the clinical trial process where all medications and found out that um, something that um, came a little bit after I was an adult was the HPV vaccine. And what we found out since there were not a lot of young African-Americans in that trial, um, that the HPV vaccine did not work on the type of HPV that's more prevalent in us. And so I started looking at clinical trial data for some of the common medications that we take, including the flu vaccine, and saw that it's not always a lot of African-Americans. So if I had the opportunity to participate and be a healthy volunteer for those trials, I definitely would participate because we find out after hard way, even with blood pressure medication, that after the fact, once it's released, it's not testing on us. And that's the come we end up in the same boat for a lot of these different medical issues. So I definitely would, and I do encourage people to. And I also want to say that it's not too late participating in clinical trials right now for the COVID vaccine. There's still a lot more more to being produced too. Perfect. Dr. Cocker, another question for you. Um, what's the difference between Pfizer and Moderna? Can I uh, get both vaccines? Should I only get one dose? Um, how are they different? Are they the same in any way? What I would say about those is potentially the same. The ingredients might be a little bit different. That's why they're stored at different temperatures. Uh, but essentially they work the same way. Um, what I recommend as far as getting one versus the other at this point, I would get what is available. The eff efficacy and the safety is, is similar. Um, so I would not choose, I cannot recommend one or the other, but I just, I would go with what is available to me. Um, I got the Pfizer and that was offered, that was offered through the job. If it was the Moderna, that's what I would have gotten. And again, based on the trials, they both have been shown to be effective and safe. And uh, another question I got is what are my thoughts on the Novavax vaccine? Uh, the Novavax vaccine is pretty unique. Um, it's a protein subunit, um, which means it uses nanoparticles uh, of a lab grown spike protein. So again, it mimics the natural spike protein as a novel COVID-19 virus. And it's a little bit different than mRNA, but it is expected to be just as safe. Um, the vaccine should be approved within the next few months and it would give us another tool um, to be used against COVID-19. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, is next up to be approved. It has 90% efficacy, but a good caveat here is that you only need one injection. And it also is a lot easier to handle. You don't have to handle it in the sub-zero temperatures that, that the two currently EUA approved ones um, have to be handled. I can see this giving us more reach into rural communities where it's harder to get those more sensitive vaccines uh, to be administered. Uh, some people uh, suspect that this is a game changer in trying to speed up the herd immunity that we can get from um, vaccination. Any other questions out there from the crowd? Hey, Ronald, we have one more. Can you, can you guys speak in regards of can pregnant women take the vaccine? So just recently, we was talking about this uh, right before that uh, they have approved uh, for uh, lactating women uh, or recommended that uh, they can get uh, co the COVID-19 vaccine for pregnant women. Um, this is all new information. Sorry, I don't know the exact answer to it. Um, but eventually, uh, with the safe it, it is and as the more clinical trials and more data comes about, um, likely would be the case for a pregnant woman. All right, thank you. And I think we had another question as well. There, um, there's one question asking, can you take multiple multiple vaccines? Want to take is that, Dr. The question is, uh, can you no. take multiple? It, uh, short answer is no. It's not recommended to get more than one vaccination. These studies, these trials are done uh, based off of getting either or vaccination um, and not done getting on getting two, two or more. So. I, I would not go beyond what the trial has already um, shown. So um, there's no benefit right now to getting two vaccinations. And in fact, it could be more harm. Um, so I would recommend not getting um, more than one vaccination. All right. Thank you. Another question. What percentage of the population needs to get vaccinated to have herd immunity for COVID-19? 
uh, someone answered this in an earlier question. To re to reach herd immunity, we need to vaccinate between 75 and 85 percent of the population. <clears throat> um, currently, there are above 25 million cases. There have been uh, above 30 million uh, vaccines has been administered. We are still a long way. We made some 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 uh, good headway. However, we're barely at the 20 percent mark um, when you combine both of those. Um, in order to reach full herd immunity worldwide, we're going to have to vaccinate around 4.7 billion people. In America, in America, that number is roughly 270 million people. So we have a long way, but we can do it. Question for Dr. Cochran. Will the uh, herd immunity be compromised if the J&J only offers 74 percent efficacy as opposed to others with 90 plus percent efficacy? I'll be honest with you, I'm a little confused by the question. I didn't quite understand the question. Would the herd immunity be affected with the Pfizer vaccination? Yeah, so to phrase it another way. If a vaccine is not as efficacious as Pfizer and Moderna, which is 95%, but another vaccine uh, has an efficacy of 60%, would you say you would not take the 60% vaccine and that would slow down herd immunity because it's not as efficacious as the Moderna and Pfizer? I'm going to give you my personal opinion uh, on that. Uh, this would kind of go back to me taking what is available. Um, I think getting a vaccination that even is 70% uh, efficacious is better than 0% efficacious. Again, I've seen the effects of uh, COVID and I'd rather have 70% have prevention um, than none. Kind of, um, I kind of look at it, the flu vaccine as well. Um, you, we, they choose the vaccination that's going to, uh, that's probably going to prevent the, the strain that is most prevalent at that time, but it's not going to cover all the different strains. But um, based on the safety profile of the vaccination, I think it's still worth getting that vaccination and not getting it at all. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Michelle Wan, our uh, chief medical officer for Vial Solutions. Technical difficulties are all solved. <laughs> She's way cuter than I am. So I'm going to take it right back to her. All right, so I'm, I'm just waiting for some more questions to load. I'm very sorry about my technical difficulties, but I hope everyone can hear me now and I can actually hear the panel. So that's um, a lot uh, more helpful. So um, let's see, are there any risks for persons with underlying health conditions like heart disease? Um, I, I'll go ahead and take that one since I was on the struggle bus for so long. Um, so I think, you know, the important thing is that people with underlying health conditions are actually more susceptible to um, becoming severely ill from COVID. So, you know, I think the, the those persons would be uh, people who would who would be even better candidates for receiving the vaccine. Um, we don't know that there are any direct um directly linked problems with people with those underlying health conditions as it pertains to their candidacy for receiving the vaccines. But we do know that they are um, better protected because they are more at risk naturally um, from uh, becoming severely ill from COVID. And uh, let's see, another comment uh, or question we have is, can you comment on the people getting vaccinated and reportedly developing Bell's palsy? Let's see. Who did I pick on last? I think I picked on Lamar last. So, um, Ron, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, there have been a few cases of Bell's palsy being reported, not just COVID-19 vaccinations, but other vaccinations. And um, if I had to pick the lesser of two evils, I would probably pick Bell's palsy. It has affected my sister-in-law and my um, sister both. And 99% of cases actually uh, return to full function. For those who don't know who Bell's palsy is, what, what Bell's palsy um, is, it is actually a paralysis of your facial muscles. And the presumed most causative uh, agent to do that is the herpes virus. Um, that is not confirmed. That is the theory amongst most neurologists. And uh, as stated earlier, 99% will have full re return of function, um, and it is also not life-threatening. It can be scary because it does look like a stroke, but again, it is uh, nowhere near as dangerous as a stroke. I forgot to unmute my mic. 
All right, thank you, Ron. Um, because of the next question here, because of the difficulty in getting the second shot, can you take one Moderna and second one Pfizer? Yes, you can. Um, it's very strongly encouraged because the data that has been published is based, uh, the efficacy data that we see is based on the first and second shot being consistent between the two. But um, if you, like the CDC recently released those new accessional situation guidelines that if you're not able to, or if you're not sure which product you receive first, then you can receive the second one, but you do need to wait 28 days in between the two vaccinations. All right, um, let's see. More questions. All right, and um, is it, I think we addressed that one already. Did you, well, during my technical break hiatus, did we address the question of will stores such as CVS and Walgreens carry the vaccination anytime soon? I, I'm gonna say uh, that yes, there, a, lot of, a lot of companies have actually been approved to receive the vaccination. Um, again, our company, Vial Solutions, um, we have been approved, but the question is when we'll receive the allocation. So a lot of these companies I'm sure have already had it, have already, um, have applied for it and have, have already put orders out there. But the question is, when are they going to receive it? And once they do receive it, they're going to put it out there to the, for the public to know. All right, here's a question. Can you comment on the race related disparities we are already seeing with vaccine distribution? What can we do to help prevent these disparities from arising? I think that's a Topic than any, anyone on the panel. <laughs> anyone? Yeah, so, um, one is uh, education, and then two, um, for our solutions, we're committed to trying to bring it to the community. Um, we have multiple testing sites, and we have a lot in the African American communities. And when we try to roll out the vaccine initiative, we will have a, a mega site in the African American community to help bring it. Um, to the people that are in most need. Clifton commented on this earlier that um, we, we have most of the time, especially in the hospital system, the least amount of resources, but then this virus is affecting us at a higher um, percentage versus uh, other races, especially black men. And one, I think as uh, uh, African-Americans, we can definitely uh, educate ourselves more about the vaccine. Also try to get places where we can get that vaccine and then you know, go to your local, um, your local um, representatives, and also advocate for more um, vaccination to be placed in your community. I think what Viral Solutions is doing is exactly what's needed. Um, we have to. We can't wait on, on people to come to these clinics, and especially people in, you know, concentrated areas in, in our communities. And in the more rural areas, you have to go to them, and they have, they have to see our faces, black people, that they can feel some level of trust in, and say like, "Yo, I have taken the Moderna, the <laughs> Pfizer vaccine, and this is what my side effects were, whether they had them or not." And inform people, educate people. When you hear the noise that's on social media, or that's coming from other people, we understand the black trauma of the past, whether it be Dr. Mims and his work with gynecology, whether it be with Harrietta Lacks, but we also have to understand that we're moving forward and we have to educate the population that yes, this is a safe vaccine. It's meant to um, protect and prevent us from catching COVID, from experiencing the um, bad side effects of what COVID can, can cause. And, you know, to help steer the trajectory into a better direction, because like I said, we're dying out here. And this it's a, a lot of ignorance that's contributing to that. And we have to fight that in our communities and not just in our spaces. Well said, thank you. All right, uh, looking for more questions here. Did you all already address the um, herd immunity question? Yes. 
Uh, should a person take the vaccine if they take monthly allergy shots? <clears throat> Dr. Cochran, that sounds like it might be in your wheelhouse. Okay, good. Um, again, kind of answering this a little bit earlier, um, I would say yes. I'm not sure what allergy shots you are, you are taking. Um, again, it depends on what you're allergic to. Um, if you're allergic to a component of that that's in that vaccination, um, at that point, that's when you might want to be more selective and possibly look at another vaccination. But in general, even those who have allergies um, can take the vaccination. Um, it, it, again, that's why you wait around for at least 15 minutes after you get the vaccination to make sure there's not a uh, more serious reaction. Um, and again, most reactions are uh, self-limiting and or you can take antihistamines um, or possible steroids for those reactions. So in general, I would say yes, but it really depends on what you are allergic to. And so I would, I would definitely, if you're prone to having bad reactions, you might want to look at what the, what the vaccination is uh, made up of. Components. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Um, the other thing to remember too, is that when you are um, getting your vaccine, there is a specialized uh, area that you should be able to be observed in. Um, and you also can extend the observation time if you have concerns about potential reactions based on your reaction profile in the past as well. So that's something to communicate to the healthcare providers on site when you're getting your vaccine. All right, I have another question. To date, has anyone contracted the virus taking either vaccine? Can you speak on the variants and should we be in, in fright mode? Um, Ron, I'm gonna kick that back to you. Yes, I can take that one. Um, to date, there have been uh, some documented cases, and I've personally seen some positive cases of people that have gotten the first dose of the vaccine, which after one dose, it gives you 50% protectivity based on the clinical trials. I have not personally seen any with the second dose. Um, in reference to the variants, um, I've been keeping up on this pretty closely. The um, UK variant appears to have uh, a pretty decent amount, uh, or the, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine with the preliminary studies show to have pretty good protection against the UK variant. Um, uh, the NVAX and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine against the South African variant uh, appears to have less efficacy, and that's where uh, a big concern is for the South African variant is more infectious. Um, not all the way confirmed to be more deadly, but the spike protein is somewhat changed on the on both the UK variant and the uh, South African variant. So this is going to be a topic of discussion for months to come. And um, we'll have more info as more people get vaccinated and if we see any reinfection rates. There have been a few. Uh, the, the country to really look at is Israel. They have had the best vaccine rollout. They have uh, the most people inoculated with the vaccine. And there have been some reinfections with people that have been vaccinated with the South African variant. However, from the preliminary data, it shows that the people who got reinfected with the South African variant had no increased morbidity or mortality. Um, it was actually more of like a mild flu. But however, this is very, very preliminary and uh, very early data. Thanks, Ron. Um, another thing to mention, too, is um, th to address the question of should we be in, in fright mode? I think, you know, I take solace in the fact that I know that scientists are already working on uh, developing booster shots specifically for those uh, variants. So there is um, there is help on the way as it pertains to the new variants as well. Um, another question, and this may have been asked already, forgive me again for my technical vacation. If I have tested positive for COVID-19, should I still take the vaccine? I can answer that also. Um, if you've tested positive for COVID-19, the recommendation is that you wait at least 90 days before you um, get the vaccine. If you're high risk, uh, there have been some experts that suggest after 30 days, you should, um, you should still get vaccinated. But absolutely after 90 days where uh, it is suspected where some immunity can wane from natural infection, yes, you should get the COVID-19 vaccine. And here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, Dr. Cochran, do you know where uh, someone can find the published list of ingredients of additives and preservatives in the vaccine, or also Ron, maybe a Ron question too. 
Is that something that's just uh, publicly available on um, the Pfizer website and Moderna website, Johnson & Johnson? Yes, yes, they are. Uh, in fact, you can do actually a search the, and they'll actually tell you on their uh, sites what the ingredients are in there um, uh, on the website. Bonus question if you guys can uh, rattle them off and spell them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so it is as simple as a Google search to get those ingredients. Okay, perfect. All right, let me look and see if we have any new questions. I don't have any new questions here. No new questions. Um, all right. Well, I think um, if we don't have any more questions uh, from our audience, um, this is a, probably a good place to pause before we pick up our um, session next week. So again, just thank you to everyone uh, who participated. Please don't forget to do your surveys. It shouldn't take you more than uh, two minutes. Um, I'd like to offer some final remarks uh, or opportunity for everyone on our panel to offer their final remarks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Clifton and Ashley again for your courage. Um, I can't say it enough. I uh, really appreciate you participating. Without you, we wouldn't have the information needed to better educate the African-American community. Um, you're going to be seeing more of our solutions. We're definitely our uh, number one goal is to ultimately end the pandemic, initially mitigate the spread, and then ultimately end the pandemic. So we will be having, uh, once we get our allocation, we will use the process that we perfected for a high throughput testing uh, facility to bring that to be a high throughput vaccination facility. And again, as stated, uh, the goal is to end the pandemic. I would just like to uh, thank the participants uh, that are actually watching this for taking the time out of your day and allowing us to speak to you. Um, I hope from this talk you've uh, learned something, um, been educated, and make an informed decision about getting the vaccination. Um, uh, for me, um, I thought it was definitely worth it and still do, and I would encourage you to, I do encourage you, you to get the vaccination. Um, I would not uh, promote anything I was not going to do myself. Um, and so I would not be up here. I did not sign up for that vaccination. So um, I hope we give you some encouragement um, seeing us up here um, of, those, of those that have got received the vaccination. We're doing good. We're healthy. Um, so I hope I encourage you all to get the vaccination as well. I want to thank 100 Black Men for even having this event. Um, 100 Black Men of South, emerging 100 Black Men of South Metro. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks for everyone that was listening. Um, I want to thank Ashley for being a participant in the trial and thank you doctors for being um, here and available. Um, it's a long fight. Um, we got a, a struggle ahead of us and I want to, anytime you need me, I'm here, I'm there. So I'm in it to win it. Let's, let's conquer this, this, uh, this pandemic. I like that attitude, Clifton. Ashley. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to thank 100 Black Men of South Metro and Emerging 100 as well. Um, Viral Solutions for putting this together and sharing a wealth of knowledge and also Clifton, who's my um, clinical trial buddy and brother here. <laughs> um, so thank you for having us. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions or anything about our experience. We'll be happy to answer any questions. And we do encourage you to get the vaccine when it comes your time. Um, it's been a real struggle for people to get vaccinated and get appointments. So that should let you know that there's something out there that everyone's trying to get. So if you have any hesitancy about that, you should wonder why the demand is so high, especially if people are you know, putting our communities at risk by us not being able to get it. So um, do your research, but I hope you can get it and let us know how it goes. Thank you, Ashley. And um, it bears repeating once again, thank you to uh, both Clifton and Ashley for being a part of that trial. Um, to our panelists, our audience members, uh, 100 Black Men uh, of South Metro Atlanta, Viral Solutions, and uh, President Vaughn of South Metro Atlanta, thank you for this evening and good night, everyone. <laughs>